Texas some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome back to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you for joining us here on a Tuesday. First Tuesday in a very long time. Thank you for being with us. We're going to talk about the Afghan withdrawal. Joe Biden promised to be the most competent president of all time. And we'll just add that to his list of lies. And you'll hear why after we come back from these words. Warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. If you struggle to understand politics, we explain it from an independent libertarian point of view. With all of the irreverence it deserves, we toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, Chris Spangle, a 15-year veteran of politics and media. Thanks for joining us here on the Chris Spangle Show. It is great to be with you. Before we start, we want to thank all of our members of Wall Plus on our Patreon. Join wallplus.com to sign up. You can get all kinds of great benefits like commercial-free shows, the entire back catalog, a thousand more episodes. You want to go back and listen to any of the old network shows like Creating Maya or Storytime of Gina. Most of you don't even know what that is. Well, you can listen to it. Much to my embarrassment. Uh, but we want to thank our $100 a month wall patrons, John Pasillo, Casey Feldposh, Lars Nordskog, Jakey Dell, Matthew Durbin, Reinhold, Christy Avery, and Jason Doolittle. Thank you so much for making all of this possible. You are beloved, and we thank you so much. We are going to be talking about Afghanistan and the Afghan withdrawal and Joe Biden. We uh, covered yesterday the history of the lead up to all of this. Uh, now we are going to talk about the uh, what happened in the last month and wh- where do we go from here. Uh, joining me is Ryan Hold. Harry had to jump off. He had to do dad stuff. Uh, we're recording these on Saturday. You can watch the live stream 10, 15 in the morning. Uh, check in with us. That's Eastern. Watch the live stream and then uh, you'll hear them on Monday and Tuesdays. Uh, so, Ryan Hold, this... Uh, I mean, when you look back, where we left last left off was just the incompetence of the Afghan government. But you knew it would be a collapse when we left. Like, I think everybody knew that that was going to be the case, that when we left and weren't propping up the government and and Obama wanted to leave but never left. Trump came in and, you know, to his credit, introduced and legitimized a strain of non-interventionist thinking, or at least that's towards that sentiment, I guess I would say, uh, in the Republican Party. And I've been pleasantly surprised to see that that's kind of held up over the last week, Um, you know, because anti-leftism in a lot of ways is more powerful than non-interventionism in the Trump Trump folks. Uh, So were they going to become war hawks again just to get Joe Biden? Maybe, but I've seen a lot of people kind of stick with their guns and say, we've got to leave. It's time to leave. But this could have been done differently. And that's definitely where I come down on it. I don't know about you. I mean, it was time to leave. Joe Biden was exactly right. We needed to leave. Uh, But when you look at, we'll examine on Friday how we left Vietnam, it's wildly different. This was zero planning. I mean, it's, it's mystifying how we got to this place where there was zero planning for this. Well, I don't know if there was zero planning. I think we're going to find that information out later. Um, because I don't, I don't think we we knew that about Vietnam at the time, right? So it probably took uh, several years to get all the information and find out what really went on behind the scenes. So you know, as far as we know, that they could have had all these great plans in place and um, were able to get a bunch of people out, or it could have been a, a massive failure that nobody knew what was going on. I I don't know if we even know that information yet. It's yeah, but doesn't it make, real. you know, normally when one side messes up, there, there are allies that kind of go, yeah, but there's these things, there's these underreported stories. This has been universally like the, no, nobody is supporting Joe Biden. There's no Joe Biden cult. Like, you know, when Trump said he could shoot somebody on 53rd Street and he'd still get away with it, like, it doesn't matter what Trump did. Like the whitewashing of the Trump administration that's been going on over these last few months is hilarious. Like, you know, Donald, this would have never happened under Donald Trump. What? Uh, You know, exactly what happened under Donald Trump because he's the one that planned it. Yeah. I mean, 
p- partially we'll we'll kind of talk about that we've got great notes from sam schultz check out our show notes but uh i don't think he would have been more competent uh yeah. but i don't think joe biden could have been more incompetent i mean at this point there's nobody out there saying yeah like in vietnam when we got 150,000 people out before the fall of saigon we're not missing 150,000 people here no, and I think a lot of people are more concerned too because we did get a lot of the people we wanted to get out out. I mean, we got our people out and that sort of thing. Um, and in Vietnam, we were able to, um, I think we got out a certain number and then including the people who got out on their own was around 150,000, right? So um, who I don't know what numbers are for this um, pullout. I don't think we have that yet, but um, as far as it being time to get out. I think it was time to get out 15 years ago yeah, or 17 years ago. Right. So because of the fact that we never really had full control of Afghanistan, Taliban always existed. You know, it was, it was inevitable that we were going to have this problem when we left, we should have looked at history and seen the last time we tried to pull out of this situation and saw what the result was. And everybody knows and, the pull-out method is not that effective. <laughs> no, the reality no, is not that, 100%. No. right. So there's a there's a fundamental moment that I didn't mention yesterday, where there's a choice that the Bush administration faces early on, where they can stay in Tora Bora, dig in, and get Bin Laden because he's in a cave, or they can go to the Ka- Kabul to take over the country and topple the Taliban, and they chose to topple the Taliban instead of our mission, which was destroy Al Qaeda and bring bin Laden to justice. Uh, And they decided to go for nation building instead. I mean, this was uh, from that choice, from that moment on, it was the fruit of the poisonous tree that this was always going to end in the Taliban retaking the country because we, you know, uh, in the movie, the outpost, they talk about death breeds death. The more war, that happens in Afghanistan, the more children that get killed, the more people that the, the more collateral damage in the cold way to put it um, there is the more you recruit for the other side. And so it's just been a strengthening of the Taliban from the entire, you know, for the last 18 years, at least uh, it was always going to end this way. So to have it topple in a week, like if you're, if your capital like it says something how poorly the last 20 years went and the 800 billion dollars we spent on this war and the 6000 american soldiers and the tens of thousands of afghan lives that have been lost in this that you can take a capital in a week by driving up and knocking on the door like it's a doordash delivery you know, that that tells you that you never really built infrastructure. You never really built a military. You never really had one Afghanistan to begin with. And it, it's it was never it wasn't a war we lost. We never even got close to winning it. Right. So the problem with war is that you can take and hold land if you have the military power and you stay there and you just keep policing it. You can you can control it. But until you change the minds of the people who live in that area, they're always going to push back. And when you walk away, they're going to rebel against you. You're going to take over. They're going to uh, get out from under the thumb that you're presenting to them. We weren't asked to be there. We weren't there humanitarianly. We weren't there to help these people. We went there and we destroyed their lives and we targeted innocents for years with drone strikes and everything else. We, you know, there's, there's stories about how many um, innocent people were killed from drone strikes and from bombings um, that we would even admit happened, you know, by the way, we only know that because of WikiLeaks and Julian Mm -hmm. Assange and uh, you know, all of the, all of the whistleblowers should be pardoned immediately. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. I mean, mean, they're uh, they're the ones who are going to face charges, not the people that just wasted a trillion dollars and and killed 6,000 Americans and multiple people. They're they're not going to face any justice. They're, they're going to be put in charge of the uh, COVID pandemic you know, these effective geniuses that just 
like Joe Biden couldn't engineer a war, let alone a, a pandemic response. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Like all we did, all these famous stories, infamous stories of us killing 15 people at a wedding with a drone, all that did was just continually, you know, Afghanistan's not Iraq, right? Uh, Afghanistan is a very mountainous region with a ton of different disparate tribal groups with allegiances to other major powers like Iran or Pakistan or India or, you, you know, we... Iraq had some measure of wealth and infrastructure and cities and civilization, right? Like these, the majority of Afghans live a, a, a farming, a subsistence farming existence. You grow what you're going to eat that day, you know, and they played the Taliban and the American military against each other for, for payments but at the end of the day, their allegiance was always going to be to the people that they sort of knew and share cultures with. So you're right. The idea that we are going to change their hearts and minds was just sort of foolish from the beginning. Well, and look what happened with Iraq, too. We pulled out of there, and now Iran is halfway running the place. Right. So it's not like, you know, we left Iraq in a, in a great position either. <laughs> um, it's not something we do very well. We don't go in and, and really... Um, nation build well right we're you know we try to do the colonization thing and, and we just don't do it look look what we do to our own territories you know we we don't take care of puerto rico and we don't take care of you know all the other places we own that aren't technically you know states and, and have representation in our government we you know they're subjects to us as it were right so yeah. uh what we've done in south america and central america honduras and so many things that you can point back to. I mean, we kind of started talking about, you know, how kind of Iraq, the, the first Gulf War kind of turned into, you know, 9-11 because we kept we kept bases in Saudi Arabia, which was their Mecca. Right. Um, but going before that, you know, what happened in Iran? Um, and, and that happened because of what we did because of oil in the fifties and which, which happened because of, you know, you just keep going back further and further. And it's just like, somebody has to one day just say, stop it. Right. And let them figure out how they want to that area to be. That's they're the ones living there. Let them self govern. Um, and we, and we just never have let them do that. Yeah. I mean, these we, poor farmers we put don't up want a big show. They, yeah. I mean, in the valleys that that exist in Afghanistan, in the middle of these major mountains with no real roads, there's no connectivity, right? Like, I don't know. It's just such a fool's errand, and and so that brings us to kind of what happened. So, uh, again, our show notes are available in a PDF form. Got all kinds of book recommendations and video recommendations, movie recommendations, as well as an outline of what happened. So you can go and check that out. So you can get the information quickly if you want to talk with your friends about all this and sound smart and you don't quite remember what we said in one of these episodes, then we've got it all there for you. Um, we really don't see ourselves as uh, the people that can explain this fully, but also just mainly guides, like trying to help you to think better in this world. So on August 15th, the Taliban captured the Afghan capital, which is Kabul, and declared the Afghan war over. So... Over the last 20 years, we have spent more than $83 billion training, equipping, and developing the Afghan National Army, their police, their air force, and special forces, and a group of people carrying light weapons. That all collapsed in, in a day. So how does that happen? Um, so we've had to go and redeploy troops now to go and try to, to not, not really secure the position, but secure enough escape routes for the people that we need to get out of there. We have about 15,000 American citizens there. The uh, Pentagon and the White House, uh, f Pentagon says five to 10,000. White House says about 12,000. The fact that the American government has no idea how many American citizens are left in Afghanistan that might want to leave is truly shocking to me, let alone the other 18,000 translators and other personnel that helped the American military over the last 20 years they are scrambling. They have no, absolutely no path to get out of the country. We're given no opportunity to, to get that organized, get that together. Um, so you've got tens of thousands of people that were just kind of blindsided by this collapsing so quickly. 
uh, and and so now we're redeploying troops to get there. So, um, one uh, commander says, uh, "No, David Brennan of Newsweek wrote. Excuse me, the Taliban did not fight their way into Kabul. They drove in. There were commuters in American cities who found it harder driving to work the next day." The American flight from Kabul will be a stain on President Joe Biden's legacy and stand as a monument to American foreign policy hubris. After two decades, trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of deaths, the Taliban are back in charge. So let's um, let's save the politics stuff for the last. Uh, but remind me to ask you about like where where does this stand for Joe Biden and and like I mean I've uh, I, I guess we'll do it now so I won't forget. But I heard Jonah Goldberg say that this was one of the greatest foreign policy blunders in American history, not just of the last few years. But the fact that this ended in a way that was so haphazard, not the withdrawal itself, even though he was in favor of not fully withdrawing, uh, not letting them collapse, but the blunder itself has major consequences moving forward. I mean, it, it, where historically would you put this as a blunder, Reinhold? Um, I would probably put this as a... Uh grade C blunder. I don't think it's the, the worst thing in the world that I've seen, especially foreign policy wise. Um, and uh, one thing kind of, we noted, and when we talked about, um, this in the, um, uh, in the, my history can beat up your politics podcast about this was that Ford, when he had his Saigon moment, right. Um, cause he was the one that, that actually implemented that, uh, leaving, um, Vietnam, it didn't even hardly touch him. There was nobody talking about that when he, we were having the election in 76 with Carter, you know, I mean, that was a year later and we weren't, you know, nobody was hitting him on that. They were talking about Watergate. They were talking about how he pardoned Watergate and uh, Nixon and let him get away with all the stuff that he did, um, which, you know, parallel wise, if you look at that, that way, um, you know, would, would Biden not going after Trump for some of the things that, that Trump did is, is that going to be more important than this? I think this fades a lot faster than, than I think people were going to realize, because at least we're out. There's not going to be any more deaths over there. We're not going to have any more. It's not going to be on the news every day. Like we have with, with Afghanistan. We still, we still had to keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. Once this is over, there's going to be 20 other things that are going to happen. How many people uh, just kind of forgot that we were still there and in a war? <laughs> I mean, don't yeah, worry I mean, if you're about this. You won't think about it in two weeks because we have the privilege of living in America. You know, right. I mean, it's – it's. Uh, hold on. I'm going to troll Darla. You want to watch me troll Darla? <laughs> so Darla writes, Jonah Goldberg is a joke. He's a neocon who still cries about Trump. I, I honestly think, Darla, that Jonah Goldberg's more libertarian than Michael Heiss. All right. Let's see what she says. Uh, that'll be good. Uh, so – yeah, I mean that there, there's no doubt about it, Reinhold. So, how did it collapse so quickly? We will tell you when we come back from this break. Oh, what a good transition! Stay tuned for more like it. Welcome back to the Chris Spangle Show. We are so glad to have you with us. Those of you on the live stream on Saturday mornings or those of you listening later, thanks for joining us. So how did everything collapse so quickly here in Afghanistan? Well, they started nibbling around the edges. The, the Taliban controlled most of the uh, rural areas. They just didn't have the cities. Uh, and they, they started eating around the edges with individual outposts in rural areas, and they they were basically like fighting against soldiers who were starving and had low ammunition and police units were surrounded by the Taliban fighters and they promised safe passage if they surrendered and left behind their equipment, slowly giving the insurgents more and more control of roads and entire districts. So in early May, a Taliban commander telephoned Muhammad Jalal, a tribal elder in Northern Afghanistan and asked him to deliver a message to Afghan government troops at several bases in his district. If they do not surrender, we will kill them. He and other tri tribal elders complied. After several rounds of negotiations, two government bases and three outposts surrendered without a fight. Okay, so 
So why May in early May? Uh, you, you, we have to go back to the Doha agreement and the agreement that Donald Trump made with the Taliban because we don't fully understand what is happening here if we don't understand uh, what's going on with the Doha agreement. So Donald Trump was always in favor of leaving Afghanistan. It's one of the best things about uh, him and his administration is that he really pushed this. Um, and so kind of jumping back to that Doha agreement so we can fully understand what that is, and I'm trying to organize myself. Uh, what was the Doha agreement? The provisions of the deal include the withdrawal of all American and NATO troops from Afghanistan, a Taliban pledge to prevent al-Qaeda from operating in areas under Taliban control, and talks between the Taliban and Afghan government. This is from Wikipedia. The United States agreed to an initial reduction of its force levels from 13,000 to 8,600 by July 2020. 13,000 troops were in Afghanistan, right? Is that because Donald Trump was the great non-interventionist hope? No, it's because he, I think, was it quadrupled troop levels? Uh, I think troop levels, troop levels when he left office were about the same as they were when he entered office. Yes, the, the, the great anti-war president Barack Obama had his own surge at the beginning of his presidency as well. So NATO pledged to bring down their numbers from 12,000 to, to 12,000 from 16,000. The United States also committed to closing five military bases within 130 days uh, and to end economic sanctions in 2020. Now, uh, that increased the amount of fighting, and the, one of the bloodiest weeks in Afghanistan happened in June of 2020. Uh, 291 members of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces were killed, and 550 were wounded. Uh, so, you know, everybody wanted to send in more troops and they did not. So, uh, you couldn't really finalize the deal until you got the Afghani government to figure out their structure of government. And so in May, Ghani signed the president of Afghanistan signed, signed a share power sharing deal with Abdullah Abdullah, his, uh, rival. And then the Afghan government had released 5,100 prisoners and the Taliban had released 1,000 prisoners. So, so to set the scene, scene, you basically have this agreement signed by the administration that they're going to leave by May of this year. Uh, and when Joe Biden gets elected, he extends that and says, you know, I, I, I'm going to honor the deal, but I want a little bit more time. And the Afghans said time is up. And so they started going through in early May and threatening the different outposts and military bases around the country. And each surrender, large or small, handed the Taliban more weapons and vehicles and vitally more control over the roads and highways, giving insurgents freedom to move rapidly and collect the next surrenders as the security forces were progressively cut off from ammunition, fuel, food, and salaries, right? So... So you, you're reducing American troops, you're reducing American control and policing, you're reducing the, uh, and as you're doing that, you're reducing the effectiveness of the Afghan security forces. You're uh, releasing all of these prisoners, which swells the ranks of the Taliban. So they're, as we're decreasing our forces, they're increasing theirs, and they start nibbling away at the edges. Uh, and the Afghan troops were then consolidated to defend Afghanistan's 34 provincial capitals. So they stopped trying to protect the little outposts and villages. They started protecting capitals. Um, and the Taliban started attacking the cities because they had locked up the rural areas earlier this year. Now, that strategy proved futile as insurgent fighters overran city after city, capturing around half of Afghanistan's provincial capitals in a week encircling Kabul. So the Taliban expanded their control among the country's 400 odd districts from 77 on April 13 to 104 on June 16 to 223 on August 3rd. So out of 400 districts, they controlled 223 by August 3rd. Now, Part of the reason that the government and the military collapsed is due to the widespread corruption. Uh, the defense and interior ministries where funds, ammunition, and other equipment are sold on the black market eventually ended up in the hands of the Taliban. So as we're sending military weaponry 
Um, you know, I think it's insane that we left everything behind when we left. We'll talk about that in a moment, but they were already picking that stuff up. It's like when the Taliban or when ISIS was driving brand new Toyota trucks, it's because we just left that stuff behind. And as the other forces that we were supporting surrendered, the Taliban would get better equipment, uh, which makes sense. You know, as you're starting to gain control, you're starting to gain equipment. So some commanders in the Afghan security forces embezzled money by submitting fund requests for the salaries of ghost soldiers. As this was happening, the security forces personnel were kept unpaid and retained on duty without permission to leave. So your, your soldiers in Afghanistan aren't, aren't being paid, which is a recipe in every war ever fought in all of history for them to abandon the cause. The uh, security forces had one of the highest desertion and casualty rates in the world. Uh, the per month attrition rate was 5,000 while recruitment was 300 to 500. So now you have unpaid soldiers who are starving without ammunition being cut off from relief supplies while the lavish lifestyles of their commanders were often too much. And instead of fighting and dying, they preferred to save their lives by surrendering to the Taliban for their amnesty offers. All of that is perfectly reasonable, rational, if you're an Afghan security forces member. Now, on the front line in the southern Afghan city of Kandahar, a cardboard box of potatoes was supposed to pass as a police unit's daily rations. They hadn't received anything other than potatoes in various form in several days, and their hunger and fatigue wore them down. Quote, these French fries are not going to hold these front lines, a police officer yelled, disgusted by the lack of support they're receiving in the country's second largest city. There was also no ideological cohesion with the army or a sense of national duty because this isn't a country. This is a country drawn by the British or the French or some colonial power pretending that this is a country. And this is why the entire African and Middle East and, and Eurasia basically are a mess. Um, no Afghan soldier was ready to fight and die to defend President Ashraf Ghani or the government. This environment of doubt and suspicion further undermined Afghan soldiers' resolve to resist the advance of ideologically cohesive Taliban. So, you know, whenever you're in a political argument and the other person has the power of ideology and you don't, it's a little hard, right, Reinhold? Um, so when fighters are driven by a desire to establish an Islamic emirate and drive out foreign troops they saw as occupiers, it became attractive to a lot of the security forces. Now, as we said last time, the Taliban arose out of 94. The group was rooted in rural areas of Kandahar province, province in the south. Uh, and in now going back to the to the Doha agreement in February, Donald Trump signed a, in February 2020. He signed a deal with the Taliban that promised to pull all the troops out of the country by May 1st of this year. Roughly 2,500 troops had remained in Afghanistan when Biden took office. And this is one of the problems with what Darla would call the deep state or just the military industrial complex, which is not a conspiracy theory. It was in the look at the exit address, the farewell address by Dwight D. Eisenhower as he talked about warning people. We've we've built all these companies and all these armaments and all of these mechanisms for war for World War Two. You have to get rid of this because if you don't, we will be in forever wars to feed these people, and, and keep these industries alive. No president, no lawmaker is going to want to shrink an industry that employs hundreds of thousands of people, and the industry is killing people. If you look at the radio stations in Washington, D.C., they're largely funded by Northrop Grumman. You know, the think tanks that push all of this ideology are funded by Raytheon. They're funded by these companies that sell weaponry that sell armaments, that sell parts for tanks. They advertise on the local TV stations. You have to remember that there is an economic gain for continuing these wars. And those contractors, those, you know, in Afghanistan, they didn't, during Afghanistan and Iraq under Bush, they didn't want to increase troop levels because it looked bad. So they hired private contractors. And so Eric Prince became a paramilitary organization with, with his organization, for instance. And so you're building all of this infrastructure that needs to be fed, that needs dollars. And I heard one uh, soldier, um, it was uh, The Political Orphanage is a great podcast by uh, a libertarian-leaning comedian named Andrew Heaton. 
and he had a soldier on who was a researcher for Glenn Beck, and he was just basically saying, like, when I was there and a soldier in Afghanistan, you cannot comprehend the amount of waste that went into this. You watch a movie like The Outpost and you see a brand new $200,000 Caterpillar, you know, uh, sh 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 what are the front-loading shovel? You know, that's in every one of these dozens of outposts around the country, right? Like the amount of money that goes into war is incredibly attractive to uh, politicians who want jobs in their district. And so, you know, it was a great thing that Donald Trump wanted to get us out and had the balls to say to all of these people, we're doing it didn't take, you know, and said we're leaving and started to withdraw. But it pissed off the military. It pissed off those contractors. It pissed off the people who rule Washington with those dollars. And they ignored him in a lot of ways. The, the people who were profiting from the forever war and the people who were earning those bonuses that Harry talked about in Friday's show uh, didn't want to follow through on this. And so the plans were not top, top tier planning, right? Like in Vietnam. And this is, uh, this is a lot of what we talked about, right, Reinhold? Like the erosion of norms are not good, right? When Mike Pence calls on January 6th, the National Guard to come save them and has no political or governmental or legal or judicial authority to do so, right? He's just a citizen at that point, basically, and undermining the president of the United States, those norms that get broken don't get put back in place. you know. And so the, one of the consequences of the Donald Trump administration, whether it's good or bad, is that the military started to ignore the commander in chief. Well, that think, doesn't end well. <laughs> I think the military uh, has been ignoring the commander in chief for a long time um, before Trump, but it became much more apparent and it, it wasn't as obvious then they weren't so blatant about it at the time. Right. So, I mean, what do you do? You, uh, you have to get people to understand why this is an issue. You have to get people to, um, stop wanting to inf inflict our will on other countries and other people. We have enough problems trying to convince people to not want to inflict their will on their neighbors. Yeah. let alone some foreign country um, where it's easier to just say, oh, those people are different. Their culture is different. We don't, they don't think like we do, you know, and, and then you start getting into um, group think and us versus them and all kinds of, a, all kinds of thought processes that smart politicians will use to manipulate you through emotions in order to keep gaining political power over you. And, and this is the inevitable result of that, you know, and yeah. people can complain about it, but we are the ones who help make this happen because we keep putting up with it for so many, you know, for so many decades. Yeah. Darla, Darla says, Oh no, not the norms, anything but that. The, the norm that the civilians have control of their military is a really good norm. You want to keep. If you don't agree with me, you don't understand history. <laughs> like that is that is that doesn't end well when the military and the the civilian government that connection gets broken. Um, so you know, and that's on the military for not obeying the president, even if the president was as erratic and wild as Donald Trump. Like it doesn't matter; he was president. You've got to do what he says. Uh, so when Joe Biden comes in. That continues. They, they don't plan for an exit. They just sort of hope that they can talk him out of it because he's not Trump. And Joe Biden, to his credit, is very resolute. And it's a very good thing that he's resolute about leaving Afghanistan. And when the president gives the military the order to exit Afghanistan, they should have plans like we had in Vietnam as we exited that. So, so I just before you go on, I will give credit to both Trump and, and Biden for two different things. Biden, I give credit for, for at least sticking to his guns and saying, we are leaving. We are not doing this anymore. This is wrong. We are going to leave. Now, what he didn't do, in my opinion, was make sure that we had a good strategy and exit plan to get out, right? The problem there is that he has been so involved in government and the military and C Council of Foreign Relations and all that stuff 
he should have been able to identify if they had a good plan or not. Trump, yeah. I'll give him credit for the fact that he was, you know, new to that environment. So he was easily more snowed, right? So he, the, the generals would tell him all kinds of things and he would go, okay, that's fine. Cause, cause he's even well, I mean, easier but, to convince. Who, who's the uh, Jim Mattis. He quit yeah. over Afghanistan. Like, remember that, yeah. like he, he didn't want to follow through on the withdrawal. And he said, I think this is going to be a disaster and I'm not going to be a part of it. So I quit. So he quit as defense secretary over Afghanistan uh, because he didn't, he wouldn't preside over it. Okay, good. See ya. And Bolton. Yeah. Bolton argued about it for, for a long time too, and ended up getting himself fired for that. These people so. have been wrong about this the entire step, every step of the way, right? Like mm -hmm. get rid of them. Uh, so, Biden didn't reverse course when he became president. He did push back the withdrawal to September and later shifted it to August 31st. Why August 31st? Because he said it on September 11th. I cannot tell you how dumb, how much of a, a propaganda victory it was for the uh, Islamic extremists that we're going to exit on September 11th, 2021, the 20th anniversary. Oh, we lost. Like, And somebody pointed that out to, to Clueless Joe Oh, maybe, yeah, but we'll make it August 31st. But it, the the Taliban said May. This is the agreement we had. So we're they started their offensive in May. Um, and, you know, Trump, to his, uh, to, he criticized Biden. Afghanistan is the most embarrassing military outcome in history. It didn't have to be that way. Can anyone imagine taking our military before out our military before evacuating civilians and other who have been good to our country. I, I, I can only do it for a few sentences and who should be allowed to seek refuge. Um, so wait, basically wait, wait, wait. He's saying, Trump about who should seek refuge to our country from foreign. What he is saying country? is, can anyone imagine taking out our military before evacuating civilians and others who have been good to our country and who should be allowed to seek refuge? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you're right. That's. I, I would think he'd. You weren't saving the military first, but he said the opposite. Uh, Trump added in a separate statement. In addition, these people left top flight and highly sophisticated equipment. Who can believe such incompetence? Under my administrations, all civilians and equipment would have been removed. All right. First sentence. Totally agree with. Second. Okay. Uh, non falsifiable. But he's exactly right. I mean. There, I saw that they're now under considering they're they're considering uh, bombing all of the equipment that they left. Um, and I, I wish I had not closed this tab, but it's a little too late. Like, why didn't you blow up all that stuff before? Instead of like the 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 Chinese have all uh, already declared the Taliban basically that they're uh, that they're the legitimate government. I think so the thought process was you're leaving, it for the, yeah, you're leaving it for the government to defend itself when you pulled out. And since they just didn't want to exist, they didn't, you know, everybody just said, laid down their arms and walked away from it because they knew that we weren't going to be there to cover their butts anymore. Um, I, I just don't think that anybody thought that that was going to happen. That, yeah. that these people were just going to uh, defect like they, you know, exactly what happened in Vietnam. They just, they, they, just a lot of soldiers in South Vietnam just started defecting because they knew that they didn't have they, that nobody had their back anymore and they couldn't do it on their own. So they just gave up. Yeah. I mean, here's the Taliban, American Ford, American weapons, American costume, <laughs> you know, uh, the shoes, I think are on the wrong, uh, wrong feet, but like, I, I don't know why you leave that much equipment for if if joe biden feels that the chinese are the greatest threat to liberty in and, and believe me I, every statement that joe biden makes about china you need to think through the lens of joe biden setting up a global conflict with china right and you have to remember what robert gates said joe biden has been wrong about every major foreign policy decision for 20 for 40 years he now gates isn't right either but He's not wrong about Joe Biden, right? So uh, if you really think that, that China is this great threat, why leave your equipment so they can then just blueprint that stuff out? Like, what? why leave 18,000 translators? You have a moral duty 
If you went to this country and, and here's part of the story that we didn't talk about in the first, you know, and, and I don't think we tell ourselves this story anymore, Reinhold, but like the story that we told ourselves before and during nine, you know, the nine 11 period was that we are the most moral country, you know, as a baby Republican, I would say, you know, when, when we took over and after we won world war two, we rebuilt the world and we didn't take over anyone's stuff. We, we rebuilt them back, but look at Japan, you know, that idea that we are a moral good when we go to war was very important to the psychology of that period. Uh, and, you know, so it's a fundamental violation that we're leaving these people behind. But I do buy on to if you broke it, you buy it. You've, right. you've, okay. you've made these people targets. You don't you have a moral duty to bring these people back to plan to bring them back. We do, but you understand how all of that you just said was propaganda that didn't really exist, right? Mm, why? <laughs> that we didn't, we went and didn't break countries and we, we, we've destroyed so many countries and made them terrible situations, including what we, some of the things we did to Japan. Um, we didn't let them have a military for 40 years you know, or something like that. It's something more, they wanted us out for so long. I mean, I, I've talked to people who live in, in Japan and they tell me, you know, that it's what we get told about certain things is just not the reality on the ground. In what way? And um, just in the way that, how do you explain it? We're getting a, when we get our news, we're getting U.S. centric, make the United States look, not horrible i mean I'll, there are some journalists who will go and try to find the bad things that we do but they don't focus on the really repugnant things that we do All right but take a look at what we right. did like i said we banana republics from the from honduras and and all the way through for the last 150 years we have done the exact opposite of what we were supposed to do in this country and we engaged in foreign entanglements and tried to nation build um, I mean, it was the one of the things when Bush was elected in 2000, he ran on the notion that we were not going to do any nation building. Right. And if 9-11 doesn't happen, maybe he follows through on that. I don't now know. As soon as 9-11. What's that? They hate us for our freedom. No, that they hate us because we destroy their countries and we make their we really lives need, miserable. We really need to do some episodes them. on the propaganda from that era because it's truly amazing that like this villager in the middle of the mountains of Afghanistan who thinks that the American troops that just showed up are Russians because he hasn't heard that 20 years before the Russians had left that, mm -hmm. that they hate us for our freedom, so we need to bomb them. And it just they don't know who we are. <laughs> right. They didn't hate us for our freedoms, they hated us because of our policies. And mm -hmm. I think it was Scott Horton. I don't I, I was watching somebody, but on as I was prepping for the show, and they were basically saying, like, there's trade-offs to everything. And I think this is the thing that people need to think about. There's trade-offs to every policy decision, there's trade-offs to every action, right? You know, Joe Biden had a choice, and he says this in his speech. I had a choice to, you know, they had left me with a choice. There was bare bones, 2,500 people, barely enough to support the country. I could leave or I could do a surge, and I chose to leave, and that's why this fell apart. Um, now, you know, the buck stops with me, and then he went on to blame the Afghan people. He blamed Trump. He blamed everybody but him, but the buck stops with him. Uh, it was truly a masterful, like I saw, like, hardcore libertarian non-interventionist like that was a good speech and there were aspects of it that were good it was so good it almost made me forget that he had decided to leave tens of thousands of people to be slaughtered by the taliban because of his incompetence um but everything's a trade-off right so you you can you can stay in afghanistan and prop that up or you can leave. There's going to be a, there's going to be a choice to make, right? Uh, I forget what the point that I was going to make, but um, you know, you you can you can lock everybody in their house, but there's trade offs. Suicides are going to spike. Jobs are going to be lost. Businesses are going to close. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then the government generally says, "Let's do that even harder," because we just didn't go far enough, right? Afghanistan, the military, the, the, these are all trade offs. So you you may uh, be able to go and start a war in Iraq so they fight them over 
over there instead of fighting them here. But the reality is the policy didn't work. Look at San Bernardino's. Look at the Orlando shooting. Look at the Sarnev brothers in Boston. These are terrorist attacks. The Sarnev brothers said that their motivation was the Afghan war, right? So at a certain point, the policies that, that were enacted didn't work. It backfired. It made things worse. So the problem with the American government, the problem with most governments, is that they never look at this and go, yeah, maybe we should change course and do the opposite of what we used to think. They double down and they do more of it. And so I will give Joe Biden credit that who, who was in support of the invasion of Afghanistan saying we made a mistake. Let's get out of this. He deserves credit for that. But uh, but I, I just think that the way that this happened was just uh, ridiculous. It was. And, and I don't think I mean, you remember Rumsfeld, that was his whole reason why he didn't want to get out of Iraq for almost, you know, eight years was because he didn't want to, you know, have it look bad when we left and things collapsed behind us right he wanted to leave a stronger country in its in our wake but that's just never happens you know it, it's it's just not how it works because you can't until you change the minds of the people like i said before until you change the 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 thought processes and the minds of the people as soon as you leave and you're not controlling them anymore they're not going to re, they're not going to defend themselves or like you because they're going to look for someone else to help to protect them and defend them right they're not they don't want to be left to the wolves we made them so, dependent on us and so they yeah. never grew strong and this is the problem with government it, it makes you dependent on them and then when that fails you are left holding the bag not them which which major political figure in in the last 30 years has gone to jail for their bad decisions in the 08 financial crisis and the January 6th insurrections and the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq. Like, where are the consequences for people that work in government? There aren't any. You can go and do in government whatever you want it to do, and you walk away with a fat book contract and a speaking gig at a think tank, you know, that pays you $200,000. Hillary Clinton doesn't get, you know, put in jail for things like Libya. She gets a book contract out of it. And that's the problem with growing the size and the scope of government in general is that it's never truly held accountable. You are left holding the bag. You must resist any sort of dependence on the state in any way. And the way to a free society is through working with other people. It's self-aspirate, right? Like self-actualization and self-government. You wake up every day. You think about what you want to do and what you're passionate about, and you build work that is meaningful, like we talked about last week. And then you work with other people on work that they find meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so when we go into these other countries and we start telling the Taliban or, or the Afghans, like, we're going to build you a school and you need to send your kids to do this or that, and they're not in a position where they can do that because they're subsistence farmers trying to grow the food they're going to eat that day, it doesn't work. And so the school gets abandoned. There's so many stories out of Afghanistan in this war where, uh, you know, we spend, the, we waste, and the overages are unbelievable on building something like a school in Afghanistan. The Afghan officials, the American officials, they all take a picture in front of the school. We leave. And then two months later, it's like, it's abandoned. Nobody's using it. It's uh, just like, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of places in the United States too. And we, it right. just doesn't work. Right. Instead and, of saying like, we're going to trade with you on things that you actually want and use mm -hmm. economics and, and trading and capitalism to get you to where you want to be. We come in with guns and say, here's your new school, take this money or else. Well, that's what we did with, with, um, uh, Russia, you know, so Russia, we kind of bankrupted, but for the most part, a lot of what led to that being a possibility was the was the decades of trying to commercial into them, right? Getting the McDonald's in there. They wanted the blue jeans. They wanted some of the American culture because they saw in Berlin, the West Berlin and East Berlin, the East Berliners would see that. That's why they put the Berlin Wall up because they didn't want the East Berlin people to see the experience that the West Berliners were having because the because those ideas permeate and they can help bring people out of those types of environments, but you can't force it on them. Right. Even, you know, even though we did kind of 
force it on them in a way by, you know, radio free Europe and, and pushing, you know, all this, all this propaganda into there. Um, but they chose to listen to it. Right. It wasn't like we were there with guns in our hands telling them they had to be f- free. Like we are, <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to point a gun at somebody and tell them that you're there to make them free and right. gonna, you're going to make them do it. Right. But it's, it's an, it's a, a flaw that all the isms have, and I have, I'm just having a big anti isms kick lately. Um, is that they just don't understand, they don't accept human nature and human nature is a, isn't i want to be free it's i want to be safe and live my life right. i want to be free but within the confines of being protected if if you take most americans and you drop them into afghanistan and make them live there they will i think they would collapse and be in, incoherent because it's not there's nobody taking care of them. They have to worry about everything that they don't have to worry about because we have an infrastructure built that kind of helps, you know, protect us from other, from other people's bad ideas. There are going to be bad actors. You have to have some protections up. So it, it's not understanding that, you know, how people think and how they want to live and what their, what their human nature is. They, it's a Pollyannic view that once we do this, this will happen. It never works out that way. Darla says, <clears throat> it's brave of Reinhold to wear a shower curtain for the entire internet to see. <laughs> oh, Darla. That was At least good I'm wearing one. something. Yeah, Darla's probably, I, I don't know if Darla is a man or if he writes as a man, has a female's name, but I guarantee they're in their mom's basement. Uh, no, <laughs> we always appreciate Darla as the voice of the opposition in the, in the comments. Uh, but, Yes. Uh, all right. Final thoughts for this. Let's wrap this up. Uh, it's moving day for my fiance. So I'm getting furious texts that I, I said I, I, I latest I'll be is one. She knows better. <laughs> so go ahead, Reinhold. Final thoughts about Afghanistan. Uh, final thoughts about Afghanistan. I am just glad we're out. I don't want us to go back. If it's equipment that we're worried about, that stuff can be easily bought on the black market anyway. It's not. We're not saving anything. If we blow it up, it. It. if we even if we blow it up, we're not really. Who cares at that point? Is there? It's not like we're leaving them equipment, uh, nuclear bombs or anything. Um, you know, just just let it go and finally put it in our past so we can look forward to a future where we're not killing people daily. That I agree. Nice. And, and the uh, I would only add to that the the governor of Guam, an American, uh, you know, fiefdom. I don't know what we call it. Uh, <laughs> uh, a state that doesn't get any rights One of has colonies. basically said, like, take out ed- anybody that wants to come. Bring them to Guam. We will host them. We will care for them. We want them here until you can process everybody and figure out what to do with them. Take them up on the offer. Get people out who want to get out. Avoid a refugee crisis of 1.2 million people has been estimated. Uh, so, yeah, I I love that idea. So, uh, Savannah, Darla says, I live in Savannah, Georgia, Chris, not in a basement. <laughs> I love Savannah. It's a beautiful town. All right, everybody. So much for joining us here on the Chris Spangle Show. We appreciate it. Tomorrow is Wednesday, which means it's podcasting day where I'm teaching you how to start your own podcast or talk about communication and how to how to like really get your message out there. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. Thursday's Liberty Explained and Friday is History Day. Bruce Carlson from My History Will Beat Up Your Politics podcast is joining us to talk about the Saigon comparisons. It was a great episode. We've already recorded it due to the magic of time shifting uh so really enjoyable so thanks to bruce for coming on thank you reinhold for being here and thank you listeners if you got value out of this please share with your friends say hey there's a podcast out there that makes me think they're not trying to piss you off they're just trying to help you understand what's going on in the world and uh maybe we'll slowly convert them to libertarianism and uh, then they can live in their mom's basement in savannah georgia so all right thanks everybody for joining us we will see you again next week